doctrine, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. And then he said, Reprove. Timothy, don't let, don't let your knees shake. And don't let your mind tremble. And whatever, and whatever congregation you find yourself, preach the word, emphasize the word, nail it at the right point, and then make it to go to the very center of their heart. When you need to reprove, do it. And then it says, rebuke. Don't let people tell you that communication is changing. And that today, what really what people want is motivation, not confrontation. When you rebuke, you know, if I, if I told you before, psychology is coming into, you know, many preachers. And if you will, you know, I don't have time to tell you, if you look at the history of the church, I told you the other day about Latima. And then, you know, after I finish with you, I have to go and check up what I said because I have to, you know, make sure that everything I say is factual. Because I read quite a lot of materials, I mean, Christian materials, I have to go and check up concerning that Latima. And I saw that I told totally it was the right thing. And then, you see, if you look at, if you look at those periods when Latima was alive, and then the time, the period of Martin Luther, and the time of John Wesley, and the time of Charles G. Finney, periods. But now, in this period, psychology is, uh, is affecting the communication of the, of the gospel. Motivation is coming in. Don't warn the people. Don't correct the people, the psychology. Don't touch them. You know, let them feel good and feel nice. And don't you, you know, make allowance for every view, make allowance for every idea, make allowance for every shade of meaning that does today. But at the time of the Puritans, it wasn't so. And at the time of the fathers of the faith, it wasn't so. And that's why we're coming back to the foundation of the word of God. Preach the word in season and out of season. And you reprove and rebuke, and then it says in that verse 3, it says, And exhort with a long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall they heed to themselves, teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou. Watch thou in all things, watch, and dear afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry, absolute commitment to sound doctrine. I told him, Matthew chapter 28, the very words of the Lord Jesus Christ, Matthew chapter 28, I'm reading from verse 19, Matthew 28, Look at the in verse 19. Absolute commitment to sound doctrine. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all the way, even unto the end of the world. And the church said, Amen. Amen. The Lord has given us the word. And he said, don't take away from me. Don't, don't prove that you are wiser than Christ. Don't say that you are more up to date than Christ. Don't say you are more intelligent than Christ. Don't say you are more sympathetic than Christ. Don't say you know communication more than Christ. Jesus said, here is the content of the message of the gospel what to give to the people he said heaven and I shall pass away but my word shall not pass away he said until the end of the age until the end of time keep telling them what I have told you teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you and he says until the end of time lo I am with you always till the end of the world which means that we need to keep on emphasizing the word believing the word and giving up the word the same word that Christ Christ gave until he comes. And so we're not proving that we are wiser than Christ. 
more merciful than Christ, more understanding than Christ. He knows the kind of power that the gospel has, the sword of the spirit, the word of God, that will pierce into the hearts of men and get them saved and get them come to the Lord. He knows the kind of word that they need. And he says, that's the kind of word that I've given you. Preach it until the end of the world. In Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16. I'm reading from verse 17. Romans 16. Verse 17. Absolute commitment to sound doctrine. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them, which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. Mark them, he said. By the way, state of us here, that's not just for our members, that's for you and for me. When you want to recommend people for interview for region overseer, state of us here, and you know this, uh, you know, sleep tongue, uh, you know that is, you know, sugar coated, I can sweet people, and it's very nice, and you know, it's a people gather, is, you know, he loves people, but he doesn't love the world. And it's a favorite of the people, but it's not a favorite of heaven. Don't recommend him for us. I don't know everybody. We need the region of a seer there, the region of a seer, the region of a seer there. And then I, you know, say to the state of us, can you recommend some people? We need to interview them so we can fill those uh, vacant places. Don't recommend people for us who can just talk. You know, just, just rally the people. You don't give us politicians who don't have any conviction. But give us people to interview. And then and when you find that there are people, when they were teaching the study scripture, they, they always deviate from the world. And they carry the people along and it so interests them and excites them because of the kind of speaking ability they have. Don't recommend us. Don't recommend them to us. Avoid them. Avoid them. Avoid them. And of course, if I'm telling the state of us here that you know, that's what I will do to you. When we have vacancies, if I want to fill those vacancies in a state, in a nation, and then I see the people, say, that person has been long here in our church, more than 30 years has been in the church, but you can never pin him down what he believes. It's not, neither here nor there. I avoid them. We don't drive them away from the church. We just allow them to stay there. And when we go to appoint people to teach the world, but I'm afraid of them. Just like Paul said, I'm afraid of the Galatians. I'm afraid of people that, you know what, were very up in more than 30 years. I'm afraid of the people that it will not take them one year. They are going to put everything from the foundation. I should be afraid of them. We avoid them. And the same thing in our districts, when we need so long leaders and parents, and the same thing in the group, when we need to fix people on the various, on the various districts, you mark the people, you know them. I received letters from the districts that they say, you know, they're trying to change the ancient landmarks. Don't recommend them to us. Who do we put there? And then we reason and we say, this person is saying, they never recommend me. They never put me anywhere. I don't know what I've done for them. Don't allow that to move you. They say that about me too. You know, they, they say, you know, he doesn't forgive people. Once, you know, he pins you down on this. God will forgive you. I said, God will forgive you. If I don't forgive people, you should look at my action. You know, sometimes I say something hard and tough, and then I go to these people, I apologize to them, sometimes privately, sometimes publicly. What do you mean? It doesn't forgive me. Of course. If you are Judas Iscariot, I live in the hands of God. I can, and that sin of Judas is not against me. That's only, only God can forgive that one. If you are holding on to false prophet or false doctrine, that's not in my hand. You cannot, you need to offend me personally, you're offending the kingdom. I leave you in the hands of God. But when it comes to choosing people, selecting people, appointing people, it says all those people that cause division 
and offenses contrary to the doctrines of renown, avoid them. Well, true. That's the Bible. We'll stand by that Bible. Again, if I didn't do that, how would I give good state of affairs to those states? If I didn't do that, how would I give good national overseers to those nations? God is not going to come from heaven and put national overseers there. He has given me responsibility. And I examine their lives. I examine their records. I examine their preaching. I examine their conviction. I examine their families. I examine their truthfulness. And then I see if they are in heart, in soul, in mind. And they are totally giving to the gospel and giving to the world, heart, soul, and mind. And there are people we can talk together and I can say, what do you stand for on this? What do you stand for this? What do you stand for this? And they stand for that same world that I'm standing for. Then I say, my brother, looks like you need, we need you in this place and in that place. Somebody that will not be afraid of the storm. Not afraid of what people say. And the same person, a person like me, that will be able to take all the name calling, that will be able to take all the knots of the people, and still stand when I find a person like that and say, We need you in that place, we need you in that place. That's what we do, I must tell you. So that if you want to be useful, it's very straightforward. You'll be committed to this word of God. If we make a mistake of appointing you, and then we see that you are not faithful to the word, we say, please come, we made a mistake. You shouldn't have been where you are. We avoid you, we remove you, and then put somebody there who will stand upon this word as we're standing. Absolute commitment. Everybody say, absolute commitment. The sound doctrine. Or stand. I said we will stand. And that's what the word of God says there. It tells us in First Timothy chapter 6. First Timothy chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 3. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 3. If any man teach otherwise and present not to sound words, even to the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud. And then it says, does he doubt questions and strives of words, whereof cometh and we strive for evil evil surmises, perverse disputes of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness from such. Tell me out loud. Withdraw thyself. If you have the same conviction that I have, if we have the same heart and the same mind and the same conviction, and we are having the same commitment to the Word of God, the people I avoid, you avoid them. But if I say this person cannot stand, see, none of the state of Osiris is my relative. None of the national of Osiris is my relative. None of the key leaders in the church is my relative. I told you before, some of my relatives are in the church. My own junior brother, the same father, the same mother, in the church. Yes, he's a worker, but I don't determine where they put him in the work. I protected this church. I protected myself from my relatives. That I do not allow even relatives to have any key important role in this church. And I don't do favoritism. Do you know? There are some people who come from the same town, the same village in this church. They are supposed to be in leadership too, but you won't know. I don't talk to them. Like, you know, we're from the same place. We're not relatives, but from the same place. You won't know them. 
Because I just ask to everybody the same, whether you are Yoruba or Igbo or else anybody you are. All I'm concerned of is this world. If that is my heart, then you understand. I don't do anything because, you know, I love you, I hate you or whatever. It's just on the word. What's your conviction based on the word of God? That's me. That's, that, that's all we need. You need to have the same mind with me. I said you have the same mind with me. Now, when I remove somebody, you must know there's a reason I remove that person. So we shouldn't quarrel, we shouldn't fight. You must understand. He's not putting his brother, he's not putting his relative there. He's just putting somebody there who stands on the word of God. Or oh, stand. Now come to point number three abnormal concentration of superficial dogmas. Abnormal concentration. On superficial dogmas. Let's come back to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. And I'm reading to you now from verse uh, from verse 9. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. That's point number one. Apostolic caution against false doctrine. Number two. For it is a good thing that they had been established with grace. That is absolute commitment to sound doctrine. Now, point number three. It says in point number three now, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. Paul the Apostle found something in the church of the Hebrews that they concentrated on superficial dogmas, meats. Which have not profited them that are occupied therein. Look at Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14, verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat. Don't concentrate on that. That's not the kingdom of God. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. If you will then concentrate on meat and drink, and then you live righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost, you are concentrating on superficial dogma, and it doesn't profit. And then we're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we're looking at verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 from verse 13. It says, meats for the belly, and the belly for meats. The meats, don't concentrate on them. They're just natural things. They're just, you know, they feed your body. They're not of eternal value. Look at what is of eternal value. Don't fight the church. Because of these superficial things that are not of any value to the kingdom. Meat for the belly, and the belly for meat, for God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. That means the Lord is the one we are to concentrate on, not on the meat. So what's telling us is that all these people that have abnormal concentration of superficial dogmas, the things that really don't count, and the things that count, they push that aside. Think about the things you fight about, and the thing you quarrel about, and the thing you complain about, and you know superficial things. And then while we are busy fighting on those superficial things, the real thing that will take us to heaven, then we abandon them. The sanctification, the holiness, the readiness, the preparedness to get to heaven, all that will push aside while we are on these needs which have not profited them that occupy their reign. Look at Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 17. Matthew chapter 15 verse 17. Do not ye yet understand, or whatsoever entereth in at the mouth, like the meat, goeth into the belly, and is cast out into the draught. He says, don't you know, the meat, how long are we going to your meat offering and 
meal offering and you know offering with this and that and those meats of the old covenant if you concentrate on them it just goes to the belly and then from the belly to the drawers but those things will proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart and they defile the man and then it says for uh, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts and murders and uh, and then it says and adulteries and fornications and thefts and false witness and blasphemy these are the things which defile a man but to eat what a washing hands defileth not a man the pharisees concentrated on those superficial things whether you wash your hands whether you go this journey on the sabbath day whether you you know cross your leg or cross your fingers or whatever but the real thing the overview and jesus said don't you know that all the things are superficial dogmas the meat for the belly and the belly for the meat but the real thing that we need to consider